One of the most controversial questions in bodybuilding, why in recent years and why even Mr. Olympia champions sport a belly? They show a belly in a discipline that was born in pursuit of aesthetics. How is it possible that in the golden era we did not see a single case of physiques with some belly? It was the whole of the 80s, this was not common either. So how did bodybuilding end up turning into this? What are the reasons behind it? The increased abuse of anabolic substances? How is it possible if in the 90s, the years where you saw the most spectacular physiques, Flex Willer, Kevin Lebron, Lee Priest, why didn't they have a belly? Why didn't they have a belly if the abuse was also evident? What was it that really made the Mr. Olympia and the IFBB not completely criminalize this issue? Was it perhaps due to the introduction of substances like growth hormone and insulin that in Arnold's time were not used? Or are we more talking about a race to ingest pounds and pounds of food to gain as much muscle mass as possible regardless of what's going on in our belly? Well, all these questions we will try to solve here today. There is no scientific literature and there is no single cause to which we can refer. Some speak of insulin resistance, even of a terrible hypertrophy of the abdominal muscles. Others mention viral fat. Others confuse this with hernias. Many go so far as to say it is due to general organ enlargement. These are answers that don't sound convincing, but it is the real reason that many modern physiques look nothing like what bodybuilding once was. Well, today we are going to try to find out, but first let's see where it all comes from. And here I have to make an important disclaimer, because many times this phenomenon has been excused by saying that it is only about moments in which the abdomen is relaxed and it is the most normal thing in the world to look like that. It is the most normal thing in the world, but here I wonder why then in the physiques of the 70s we do not find any case. Even if we go to the back poses, which is a tragic pose for those who have a distended abdomen, why? Because on the stage it is possible playing with the post without disguising an obvious abdominal distension. This begins to be noticeable in the transitions to the side poses in the moments where we are relaxed in a fateful pose, the double biceps on the back. We have dozens of images of champions, including Mr. Olympias, totally losing control of his abdomen in this pose. And since it is not visible, it doesn't seem to matter so much. Although in the golden era, even in the back pose, we can see totally flat bellies. Physiques. Well, I think Kevin Lebron's was a sufficiently monstrous physique for this to happen. Let's not talk about Lee Haney, who was eight times Mr. Olympia. Very big physiques, very massive physiques which you see a control of the abdomen at all times. Also, of course, it's not normal to have a flat belly and abdomen all the time, but we're supposed to be at a point of competition with a very low fat percentage. The facility to keep the belly contracted should be very high, but nevertheless, this does not happen. For that reason, I would like to go back quite a few years in time to find out when all this started. The most logical is to go to the era of the mass monsters, the time when we saw the biggest and also the most conditioned physiques. Anyone who is even a little aware of the history of bodybuilding will know that the big turning point in all of this was Dorian Gates. His physique was a paradigm shift towards prioritizing size, but also the most extreme condition ever seen to date. Dorian's physique had to be said that for me it broke with that classic line that we were seeing with Arnold's Mr. Olympias, Frank Zane's and so on. Of course it was a proportionate physique, but more than for its aesthetic line, it stood out for its enormity and above all for its definition. But of course, achieving this physique came at a price. The price of putting on more muscle mass than any other physique. And for this we resorted to the most caloric diets in bodybuilding, the volumes of Dorian Gates, something very remarkable and something that made him look with a spectacular size. This marked the line for us to see other physiques such as that of Nasser El Sambati, the future, of course, Ronnie Coleman. The criteria for the Mr. Olympia had changed and with it people began to speculate that this was possible thanks to the introduction of new substances that were not consumed before. And make no mistake, the abuse in the golden era of anabolic substances was not little. No matter how much Arnold or Tom Platz insist on saying that they hardly took any. However, we do not know that in the 70s those physiques required two substances that for many changed bodybuilding insulin and growth hormone. Bigger physiques require more extreme volumes. More extreme volumes require the consumption of huge amounts of food. 
Absorbing all the nutrients from this food would also require the introduction of that substance that makes the body can assimilate all those nutrients. On the other hand, to say that this is exclusively due to these two new substances is not rigorous. We cannot say with certainty. It is not really a conclusive argument. Not all physicists have carried out these practices. They have necessarily ended up this way, so we cannot argue that it is due to this, as many on the internet do. It is probably an accumulation of practices carried out. And is that Dorian himself? Remember the first great massive physicist speaks of insulin and GH to refer to his last stage in the because yes, Dorian's physique came to present a fully distended abdomen. If not, just look at these images at FIBO. On the other hand, in Dorian's best years, we are still not shown that kind of physique we are referring to. Of course, we are not talking about the narrowest waist in the world, but this is not necessarily a sign of a distended abdomen. Dorian Yates' first Mr. Olympia. Very good control over his abdomen, really impressive physique, and we only have to go to what he himself told us about this kind of substance. What do you think about using of insulin in pre-contest, off-season and so on? Well, I never used insulin uh, pre-contest because I was always very concerned about getting super shredded condition and I felt that would interfere with it. Uh, I did use insulin in 96 and 97 in the off-season and I was able to get a bit bigger but I don't believe it was quality, you know, and uh, the waist started to get a bit bigger, you're holding more water in the muscle, so of course you're heavier and you're bigger, but you have to lose the water anyway. So for a yes, exactly. And uh, perhaps this is one of the reasons that we see a decline in the quality of the competitors. Yeah. You see a lot of guys with a lot of muscle, but uh, not quality, not the condition. And uh, I'm going to say, I said it before, even the professionals at Mr. Olympia, the condition is not great now. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, but it's not. Yeah. Dorian's harsh words really link many of the ills of bodybuilding today to insulin misuse. But now I'd like to talk about another of the popular beliefs in bodybuilding, which is the growth hormone myth. In my opinion, so much of this phenomenon of distended abs has been associated with the use of growth hormone, in particular by one person in particular. We are talking about Dave Palumbo. Palumbo's is the quintessential pregnant belly physique, the most obvious case and one of the earliest. And it must be said, a physique that breaks with the whole essence of bodybuilding. If we are looking for a structure in equis, harmonious, proportionate, then that bulge in the abdomen breaks with all that aesthetics. By the way, the opponent against whom we see here, Dave Palumbo, is the historic Rich Piana. These are images from the NPC Nationals of 1999. The point is, no matter how conditioned, vascularized and big a physique may look, if there is no control over the abdomen, everything else is overshadowed if we take into account the criteria by which bodybuilding was born. The thing is, Dave Palumbo was convicted and sentenced to five months in federal prison for distributing growth hormone to athletes. I believe this is where this association of this particular substance with bloating came from, that many people started saying Dave Palumbo's physique growth hormone. Here we have the motive when it really doesn't have to be. This was a high profile case, but it is that after Dorian's bad years, we already started to see a trend change in bodybuilding. And here is where it is worth pausing to analyze the curious case of Ronnie Coleman, the best bodybuilder in history. But curious to see the disposition of his abdomen when he started his career as a professional and how he ended up looking when he finished his career. Yes, the best bodybuilder of all time was also a victim of a more than obvious abdominal distension. For me, Ronnie Coleman was the pinnacle of bodybuilding. How was it possible for a person to go out on stage so conditioned but at the same time with all that muscle mass? Well, Ronnie Coleman was also one of those bodybuilders who sacrificed part of his midsection in order to keep putting on pounds and pounds of muscle. The linea alba of his abdominal clearly gains a separation, consequence of a widening of his abdomen. The same, her obliques, even at an extreme fat percentage, are widened. How is this possible? For example, more recent cases, Quion Pearson's. For me, the best structure of all today. Superhero physique with a totally thin waist, but who we have seen him go from classic physique now to a major category where in a very short time he has been forced to put on many kilos and we see him still maintaining a structure of 10, which is a genetic prodigy, but it is evident that that line of the abdomen is separating. In some relaxed snapshots we also see a certain abdominal distension, an abdomen that no longer looks so aesthetic. How is this possible? 
Well, to understand the reasons for this, we can go to the cases of pregnant women, where indeed, after suffering a pregnancy with all that entails, it affects the muscles of the abdominal cavity. This is known as abdominal diastasis, and 66% of pregnant women suffer it in the third trimester of gestation. In the end, abdominal diastasis is the separation of the rectus abdominis musculus as a consequence of this tissue damage, which under normal conditions would hold them together. But due to this pressure on the tissue, it is normal for the linea alba to be damaged because it cannot withstand all the tension to which it is subjected. And knowing this, we come to the reign of Phil Heath. When he dethroned Jake Adler, we could see in his physique one of the most privileged genetics in history. So much so that he went on to win seven Mr. Olympics. But Phil Heath in his later years was also the victim of an abdominal distension more than evident. So much so that the Mr. Olympia that wins to Big Raimi, the problem is already more than notorious. It is that when a physique loses that midsection, even if it keeps all that roundness in arms, legs, even deeper cuts, a distended abdomen completely soils the entire aesthetics of a physique. But in those years, there was a very tough rivalry between Kai Greene and him, where every year the improvements in both were evident. So there was a race to come out with a bigger and bigger physique, more and more separated because they knew between them that they were very tough rivals. However, this race also took its toll on Kai Green, whom we see in certain poses, like in this side chest, which for me is unforgivable. Of course, Kai Green has historic genetics and physique, dare I say, but that doesn't take away from the fact that this snapshot here is unsightly, a belly protruding from the pes. Even when she has the post nailed, to my way of understanding bodybuilding, of course it should be penalized. And during this period of time, a blind eye was turned to a more than obvious problem. A problem that had to be remedied when Phil Heath was going for his 8th Mr. Olympia. The abdominal control was already insurmountable, and it was precisely this that made one of the most unique genetics in history, such as Phil's, did not enter the Olympus with Lee Haney and Ronnie Coleman, and remained at the gates of achieving it. Of course, that physique was no longer competitive, but along with him, there have been other bodybuilders like Rolly Winkler. But now the question is, why is this happening? If they used to take very high amounts of anabolic steroids, why is it happening now? Is it the introduction of new substances that cause it? Well, I have to say that there is no clear answer to this. There are no scientific studies that have studied this particular issue with bodybuilders of the highest level. Only the experience of the trainers who were behind the reconstruction of these physiques can know the immediate causes that lead to this abdominal distension. And on this we have three main hypotheses. I will put them forward and then give my opinion. One of the myths that is already disproved is that this is due to the growth hormone that with a high dose and prolonged use, would produce megalic organ. This is an enlargement of the organs of the body, including our intestines, and hence some people come to think that this is the reason for the bellies in bodybuilding. But if this were so, we would not see the cases of bodybuilders who also presented a large size after having had a belly, but were able to correct it. So this hypothesis that the organs grow so large as to produce a belly, I am afraid, is the least substantiated hypothesis. However, there is another position that blames this not so much on growth hormone, but on insulin. Insulin is a hormone that is released by the pancreas in response to increases in the here its function is to help move sugar from the bloodstream into the cells. The only people who necessarily require pharmaceutical insulin, i.e. That dose of exogenous insulin are people diagnosed with diabetes. In this health condition, the body does not produce enough insulin. In case it is type 1 diabetes, it has become insulin resistant, which is known as type 2 diabetes. Taking insulin without eating carbohydrates causes low blood sugar levels, a hypoglycemia that can lead to everything from seizures to coma and even death. Knowing this, what non-diabetic would want to expose themselves to using this exogenous insulin when they have a fully functional pancreas naturally? Well, let's imagine the situation in bodybuilding in the 90s where they wanted to reach weights never seen before. And for that food and carbohydrate intake, we are talking about people who could easily reach a thousand grams of carbohydrates a day. There are many nutrients that the cells have to absorb and hence the use of this substance in an obvious anabolic effect. In the end, insulin promotes the storage of carbohydrates in muscle cells, and although it is not a steroid as such, it acts synergistically with them. 
So yes, this is a compound that was not common in the 80s and that curiously years later Dorian Yates and Ronnie Coleman himself claimed to use this substance at some point in their careers. Ronnie Coleman in a very interesting interview with Tom Platt talks about the first use he gave, it was pre-competition to make a carbohydrate load. Later, in the same interview, he talks about using it in off-season, but well, it is not really referential information. We are talking about Ronnie Coleman, a genetics that is not common. I think it was for these reasons that many people directly blame the use of insulin to subsequent pregnant bellies in bodybuilding. Also, there is evidence that its use promotes visceral fat accumulation. This is subcutaneous fat that is between the organs. Even if a bodybuilder goes down to extreme fat percentages, if these viscera are in the body, well, it can produce that pregnant belly feeling. But this is where we enter the third and final hypothesis. The hypothesis that fits me the most with all this, and I am going to document why. Let's see. The 90s not only come with this new substance, but they are also the years where we see the highest calorie and most dense diets we have ever seen. To get to build all that muscle mass required grams and grams of carbohydrates, of course also the rest of macronutrients. But let's think about when a bodybuilder consumes a lot of carbohydrates, it is normal to develop insulin resistance. This will raise blood sugar levels, and here what we know as hyperglycemia occurs is that we can get to have chronically high blood sugar levels, then the body reacts, it tries to recover from this problem and while doing so, the intestinal transit is severely affected. If not, just look at these two comparative images that draw very well the difference between a body that does not suffer from intestinal transit problems and one that does. In the end, having a good intestinal transit is something vital since the intestinal flora protects the intestine from bacteria. And this is where we need to talk about bacteria. Bacteria in the colon do their job. In the end, not all carbohydrates are absorbed in the small intestine. The ones that pass into the colon are known as the food maps because they are the food for these bacteria that ferment these food maps and that is where a series of gases are released. In the end, these bacteria have very important functions for the organism. In the end, they are involved in the absorption of vitamins and minerals and are key in the development and maintenance of the immune system. But when can there be a problem? Well, this bacterial content, more than 95% of it, lives in the colon. In the end, the stomach and small intestine contain only a meager number of bacteria. But now let's take the case of a diet of a bodybuilder who consumes even more than 10,000 calories a day. How many digestions does he have to do? It is very common that the speed of intestinal transit for this very reason is affected. And then, if our intestinal transit is affected by so many heavy digestions, reflux can occur. This reflux leads these bacteria to the small intestine and then we can have a large accumulation of these bacteria also in the small intestine. As we will remember that its function is to expel some gas content, then this can clearly enlarge our belly. We can stop here. The subject is already too complex to go further. But here Dr. Gut speaks of an issue that I think it is at least interesting to delve into it and at least investigate it. He speaks of the visceral reflex. This is an autonomous reflex that our body makes and that is produced in the soft tissue organs. That is, it can happen in the heart, in the reproductive system and of course also in the digestive system. The point is that these nervous system reflexes are mostly involuntary reflexes. Some examples of these reflexes that we cannot control. See pupil dilation, blood pressure, heart rate, body temperature and also digestion. And why are we talking about all this? Well, we know that doing so many digestions can increase the gaseous content of the intestine. This causes the abdomen to expand. And here what Dr. Good tells us is that when this is already the norm in our body, that the intestine is expanded, this reflex is activated, the diaphragm separates to facilitate breathing. Then to accommodate the muscles of the abdominal wall, many times we tend to contract the abdominal muscles, which hardens the abdominal wall. However, if there is an increase of gas in the intestine, it is normal to do the opposite. The nervous system sends a signal to relax the muscles of the abdominal wall to accommodate this increased volume. This is what Dr. Gutt calls an abnormal visceral somatic reflex. Here the obliques relax. That means that the abdominal circumference increases significantly. What there are clinical studies on is the effects of high calorie diet, which indeed come to create this abdominal distension. But these studies are simply focused on overweight people and not on bodybuilders, who owe this overweight mainly to the large amounts of muscle mass and not so much fat. But I have to say, 
This last hypothesis is the one that fits me the most, otherwise we would not have seen bodybuilders who from one year to the next have managed to correct their intestinal health and have eliminated this problem of looking like they have a pregnant belly. Let's look at Raleigh Wingler himself, Phil Heath, he looks much better now too. Nick Walker himself, he seems to be more and more aware of this and it's what he's most concerned about in the face of the clean bill of health. And is that, let's see, this was done by Dave Palumbo himself, that is, the king of the bellies, the man who named this whole phenomenon, as he himself dared to show the state of his abdomen nowadays, and it has nothing to do. And also the case of Ben Pakolsky, a case that particularly shocked me a lot, because look at the state in which he presented his abdomen with an obvious distension and how he managed to correct it to show an incredible midsection. It looks like another different bodybuilder, so you can see if that midsection really makes a difference. And I'm going to finish the video exposing because I think this is an important issue for me, I repeat, for my own vision of bodybuilding. I think that bodybuilding ceased to be attractive to the general public when we reached those worst physical versions of Phil Heath that it is really very difficult to sympathize with, wanting to have a physique that at times it seemed that a very high percentage of bodybuilders were hopelessly doomed to have an abdominal distension. Much easier to feel attracted by that golden era of Arnold. And I think that is also why now the classic physique figure of Chris Bamstead have returned to attract so many people to this sector. And don't get confused, I'm not one of those who say that bodybuilding is only aesthetics or something like that, not at all. For me, aesthetics is indispensable, but it is as simple as that if every year comes a good aesthetic, but a little bigger, it is normal that the eye always goes to the biggest bodybuilder. It is the natural evolution that bodybuilding has followed, of these increasingly heavier physiques. The spectator demands new things. Those physiques like Dorian Yates, Nasser El Sombati, then Ronnie Coleman, had never been seen before, never seen so much size. What happened? A man named Ronnie Coleman came along. And what's left after him? What's left for us to see after a physique like that? The viewer keeps demanding more and more size, because the bodybuilding trend was upward, but on the other hand, the competitors were not Ronnie Coleman again, because Ronnie Coleman was someone else. So, in my opinion, this was a consequence of a race to see which bodybuilder was bigger. In the golden era, there wasn't that need. There wasn't a need to be exposed for so many years to such heavy diets and digestion. I'm not saying that they weren't extreme diets or anything like that, but it's clear that they weren't that extreme. Like that of the bodybuilder who already aspires to weigh about 130 kilos, which is what we have yet to see after Ronnie Coleman. And here, the surprising thing is that for the benefit of that size, Mr. Olympia did a to that abdominal distension that was so frequent in so many competitors, he came to normalize. And mind you, what I'm about to say is already a personal opinion. This is my way of seeing bodybuilding. I'm saying it's right and wrong. This channel is a means to express my vision. It is not an informative channel or something like that. No, it is neither more nor less than my channel. I think it is important to penalize completely that abdominal distension just as it was done with gynecomastia at the slightest symptom that does not allow you to make good posts. And it is very curious because a channel even made a list of how the Mr. Olympia would be if this criterion were applied from the beginning. That is, if we remove all the Mr. Olympias in which there was this abdominal distension. And beware, I do not propose to reach this level of radicality or something like that because in the case of Ronnie Coleman it is clear that from his fourth Mr. Olympia this was an increase. But of course, we are talking about the fact that it was nothing exaggerated as it was in the case of Phil Heath, who was such a dominant physique in all other aspects that your eyes would go to him. But it's really curious and interesting to see this list. I think that since Mr. Olympia has come to make many excuses for the benefit of size to forgive many of these distensions. But what can I say? That perhaps we have already reached the limit that we can see in terms of size. This means that unless we are Ronnie Coleman, there is a threshold that we cannot go beyond unless the waistline is compromised. The moment you sacrifice your symmetry and your aesthetics to look bigger, well, to me, that should be penalized. So when we talk about a bodybuilder's genetics, we're not just talking about their insertions or structure and such. In the end, his digestive capacity is very important. And well, we've shown how there have been physiques that have been able to remedy this. Nick Walker himself seems to be a little bit more focused on controlling that abdominal area than just continuing to grow and grow. It's probably one of the problems with wanting to grow so much in so few years. Be that as it may. Here's my opinion. I want to hear yours. I hope you liked the video. 